Well, hey, good morning. <laughs> so I bring my own hype crew wherever I go, apparently. Uh, no. Hey, uh, how are you guys doing this morning? So it sounds like like this side, Duke fans. This side, UNC fans. Is that like sacrilegious to talk to? Anyway. No. Hey, uh, my name is Nathan Lewis. I am the Winston campus pastor here, and I have the honor, the privilege to finish up our open series today. We are in week four, um, but I just want to pause and say that anytime I get to get up and do this thing, uh, to speak, to preach, um, I am eternally grateful uh, for God, you know, one, asking me and calling me to do this, uh, but then also for Pastor Matt allowing me to do that as well. And so I just want to say thanks, Pastor Matt. Thank you guys for acting like you listen to me whenever I come up here. Um, I appreciate that. That makes me feel really good. Uh, but like I said, today is week four, final week in our open series. Week four. It's almost done. But several weeks back, Pastor Matt brought us a word that, like literally a word, like a word, and that word was ephephatha. Say that like 10 times fast. It's ephephatha. 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 But that word ephephatha means be open. And so in Mark 7, where this word is found, like we see this incredible miracle going on where Jesus is healing this deaf and mute man, and he's got his fingers in his ears, and he's looking to heaven, but then speaking to the man, and he says, Ephephatha, be opened. And in that incredible moment, we saw this simultaneous opening of both heaven and the man. And so that incredible miracle, that story has led us to ask the question every single week, how is it that we can position ourselves and posture ourselves to be open under an open heaven? Because the reality is heaven is open to us. The, the issue is that a lot of times, like, we are the ones that get in the way of, in a lot of different ways, and there's some blockage there, right? And so a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago or so, we started off by looking at what it means to have open ears that we might hear the voice of God. And then the next week, we looked at what it is to have open eyes, to see our situations and our circumstances around us as God sees them through God's eyes and God's lens. And then last week, Pastor Matt brought us a strong word about what it means to be open-handed, to live generously as God lives generously, uh, because the reality is like you and I are stewards of everything that we have here. We have to put things back in the box um, at the end of this life. And so Look, uh, if you have not heard any of those, a couple of those, one of those, something like that, if you're a VIP with us today, like I highly encourage you to go back and to check those out uh, online at rescuehousechurch.org. But like I said today, week four, before we dive in, every single week we have said a prayer together, um, and I want to start that, that uh, prayer as well, uh, start today off with that prayer. And so uh, the words will be on the screen here. And I'll go one, two, three, and then we'll do it. It's not one, two, and then on three we do it. There's a lot of discrepancy about that. All right, so it's one, two, three, then we'll go. All right, ready? One, two, three. Heavenly Father, open me. Open my eyes to see what you see. Open my mind to think like you think. Open my heart to love like you love. Open my hands to give like you give. Open my ears that I will have ears to hear. Heavenly Father, open me. In Jesus' name, amen. That is a bold, bold, bold prayer. Because today what we're going to talk about is what it means to have an open heart under an open heaven. You know, there's a line in that prayer that says, open my heart to love like you love. And that's a really big request, like an unbelievable request to ask to love like God loved. But I think a part of the reason that it's as big of a request as it is is because it leads to a massive, a huge, a flippin' big question. And that's how does God love? Because in order for us to love like you love, like we have to answer that question. We have to say, like, how, how do you love? Thankfully, we don't have to necessarily do a whole lot of work to figure that out. Um, a lot of people smarter than me uh, have gone before us and have basically tossed out this one word for centuries to describe God's love, and it's unconditional. God loves us unconditionally. He loves you and me unconditionally. 
And the definition of unconditional is this. It's not limited by anything. It's absolute, free from restriction or limitation. And so uh, Sarah and I every night read um, Bennett, our, our two-year-old uh, Bible story from his Jesus Storybook Bible. And so <laughs> as we read through these different things, this unconditional love pops up a lot even in this Jesus Storybook Bible. And, and it describes the unconditional love of God like this. It's a love that is never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. Like, that's awesome, right? But there are numerous stories in the Bible that kind of show us what that love looks like. As a matter of fact, like the Bible itself is a big, massive, unconditional love story. And don't worry, we're not going to look at the whole Bible today. We don't have enough time for that. But I do want to look at one particular story this morning because I think it's going to be absolutely perfect for us to wrap our minds around what it is that this unconditional love looks like. But I also think that this story is perfect because not only does it show us this picture of an unconditional love of God, this love that we need to love like as well, but it also shows us a couple of blockages, a couple of things that get in the way of us having an open heart under an open heaven. And so if you've got your Bibles with me, go ahead and turn to John chapter 8. Uh, we're going to have some of the scripture up on screen. I'll be reading from a couple of different translations. But as you turn, as you kind of get ready, here's the background to John chapter 8. Jesus has been preaching and teaching in the temple for several days now. And as Jesus usually does, he can draw a crowd. Like the dude has tons of people come out to hear what it is that he's got to say. People are loving it. They're eating it up. They're loving what he's saying. They're loving what he's doing, except for one group of people. There's one group of people that are not real big on this Jesus guy. As a matter of fact, they like just completely and totally hate this Jesus guy, and they want to do anything and everything they can to shut him up. And so they come up with this incredible plan in order to discredit anything that he has said and anything that he's going to say going forward. These guys have created a sex scandal that they're going to catch this Jesus guy up in. Sounds pretty familiar. This is not a unique idea for us today. So that's what's going on, and they've got this thing planned down to a T. Like, the, the I's are dotted, the T's are crossed, everything is perfect, and they put this thing into motion. And John 8, verse 1, picks up right as they blow this thing up, and they're trying to make it go viral. Jesus has just come back into the temple for another round of teaching. As always, there's a big, massive crowd there. He's in the middle of preaching and teaching. He's doing a good job. He's bringing the fire. He's bringing the word. When all of a sudden, this group of religious leaders and teachers that hate Jesus bust through the back doors and bring a naked woman up to Jesus and just throw her at his feet. So, like, imagine that everything's going on right now. And at this moment, like, the door busts open and this group of guys, don't turn around because we're not going to do it. But this group of guys brings this naked woman up to the front of the stage and just, like, throws her down right here. Like, we'd probably see a tendon spike for sure. But, like, that's what happens. Right? So that's what's going on right now. And so they throw this woman at Jesus, completely and totally naked and vulnerable. And they look at him, and they interrupt everything, and they say, Teacher, this woman was caught red-handed in the act of adultery. And I think that it's at this point, just as a side note, that like everybody that's around watching this thing, whenever they say this, they go, <gasps> so when I read this, I need you to do that for me, okay? I'm going to read the sentence again, and when I get to that part, you're going to go, <gasps> all right. Teacher, this woman was caught red-handed in the act of adultery. It's perfect. <laughs> Moses, in the law, gives orders to stone such persons. What do you say? <laughs> this is it. They have got this guy cornered. There's no way he can get out of this because there's only two ways that he can answer. And either way that he answers this, he has completely discredited everything that he says. Everything. Because on the one hand, if he says, oh, man, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you should probably stone her. Then he discredits everything that he has talked about up until this point about forgiveness and mercy and grace and compassion. But then on the other hand, it, 
if he says, no, no, like you can't do that, then here Jesus is going against the very law that God himself handed down to Moses. Jesus is in a tight spot here. Like either way you slice it, like he, he's not in a good position here. And so the room is dead quiet. You can hear a pin drop. Everybody is waiting and staring at Jesus to answer this group of guys. But he doesn't answer them. He doesn't say a word. Instead, what he does is he just kind of stands there for a little bit, and, and then he bends down, and he begins to write in the dirt, and the dust at his feet. And the people that are in the crowd, they're like, what's he doing? They're trying to you know, get a push in, trying to take a look at what it is this Jesus guy's doing. Like, he, he needs the answer. Surely he heard them. Well, that's the same thing that this group of religious leaders and teachers are thinking. Like, hey, we know you heard us. And so they actually call Jesus out on the carpet. They're like, dude, you can act like you're going to ignore us. You can act like you didn't hear us everybody in this place heard us ask you this question, and so we need an answer, man. Like, what is it that you say that we're going to do with her? Jesus still doesn't answer. He just continues to write in the dust and the dirt of his feet with his finger. They just keep going and going and going, just badgering him and badgering him and badgering him. When finally Jesus, Jesus stops writing and he stands up, and I think he kind of dusts his hands off a little bit. And he puts his hands on his hips and he looks down and he kind of nods and he's like, hmm. yeah, that's good. And then I think as he answers him, he kind of points down to the ground to bring their attention to what it is that he's written. And this is what he says. He says, the sinless one among you, go first. Throw the stone. And then he bends back down, <laughs> and he starts to write in the dust and the dirt again. After what seems like an eternity, there's finally movement from this group of guys, this group of religious leaders and teachers. But it's not the movement that the crowd expects. Because what ends up happening is this group of religious leaders and teachers begin to walk away and leave, one by one, Oldest to youngest, the Bible tells us, just full of disappointment. They failed. The plan didn't work. And so everybody's amazed. And these guys walk off one by one <clears throat> until eventually this woman is left alone with the crowd and Jesus. Jesus is still writing in the, the dirt and the dust. I mean, the dude must have read John Grisham novel. I don't know. But he finally gets done. And again, he stands back up. And I think he dusts his hands off. Puts his hands on his hip. Nods and says, yeah, feel good. And then he starts to scan the crowd. Just briefly, just looking at everybody's face in the crowd. And then he focuses his attention on the woman. And now needless to say, it, the woman is not making eye contact with Jesus here. The second that she stepped into this room and these guys drug her into here, her face has been down. And she has, the most interesting thing apparently is at her feet for this entire time because she has not looked up once. She is not going to risk the opportunity of making eye contact with anyone there. But even though she's not looking Jesus in the face, Jesus can see that this woman is just covered and racked with shame and guilt and humiliation and disgrace. And I think his heart begins to break. And I think knowing Jesus, he begins to look at the woman again and his eyes begin to get a little misty. And he walks over to her, and with one finger, the same finger that he was writing with on the ground, 
He puts it under her chin and gently raises her face until she's looking at him eye to eye. And then oozing with compassion, grace, and mercy. He says this to her. Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? I don't know if anybody else other than Jesus could hear because she's so humiliated, but she answers, no, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, looking her square in the face, neither do I. Go and sin no more. And that story wrecks me every time I read it. Every time. Because it is an incredible picture of the never stopping, never giving up, unbreakable, always and forever love of God. And I wish with everything inside of me that I could live in love like that. But I don't. That's honestly just not the case. Because like I said, this is not only a picture of this incredible, unconditional love of God. This also shows us a couple of different blockages that we have in our heart that keeps us from truly having an open heart under an open heaven. And I think that there's two main blockages. And the first one is this. It's an attitude of arrogance. Because in a moment of complete and total transparency with you this morning, I too often find myself loving and living like the religious leaders and teachers than I did Jesus. See, because these guys were the religious elite. Like, they were professional Jews. This is what they did. They knew what to say. They knew what to do. They knew when to do it. They know how to make themselves look good. And so what ends up happening is that this arrogance starts to creep into their hearts. And so they start labeling people undeserving, unworthy, unlovable, And if I was really honest with you, too often I do the very same thing. Like, I mean, the dude this morning on my way to Mossville, the people that have no idea how to merge onto a highway, the speed limit is either 65 or 70, not 30. It's the skinny pedal on the right, dude. Or like the people that cut you off in traffic too, like unlovable, undeserving, terrible people. There's a hotter corner in hell for those people. Those people that are just beyond rude, like that have no filter apparently and have no no like thought process for other people's feelings, the people that are, are arrogant and pompous, not nice words, like the people that stabbed me in the back, the significant others that that cheated on me when I was younger, the people that constantly run my name through the mud, the people that hate me, those are the people that I tend to label undeserving, unworthy, unlovable. And it's hard for me, seemingly impossible sometimes, to have an open heart under an open heaven when it comes to some of these people that, like, just, no, I don't feel like they deserve it. Have you ever heard the phrase, like, God love them because nobody else does? Like, that's constantly goes through my head. That's not the attitude or the posture that we see here from Jesus. The way he loves in this story is truly unconditional, never stopping, never giving up, unbreakable, always and forever. It's not a love that's proud or boastful. It's not a a love that keeps a record of wrong. And it's toward both the woman and the arrogant, pompous, not so nice worded religious leaders and teachers. See, what we see in Jesus And him loving both her and that group of people is that Jesus loves the unworthy. Jesus loves the unlovable. 
And in order for us to have an open heart under an open heaven, we must, we must love those that we believe to be the most awful, undeserving, unworthy, ridiculously terrible people in the history of mankind. We also must love the unlovable. We must pour out this never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love to those people that don't know how to merge on a highway. The people that constantly run my name through the mud. The people that abuse their power. The people that keep other people down. The people that just, the black sheep in the family that we just absolutely can't stand, that has no concern for anybody else in the world other than themselves. We must love the unlovable. But that's not the only blockage that we see here because a, a lot like our physical hearts, like people have open heart surgery in order to remove blockages, you know? Um, but like if, if you don't get to it in time or like you let it go or whatever, like that blockage can eventually like lead to another blockage. Um, and I think that that's the case with this story as well. Like, so there's this blockage of, of this attitude of arrogance that creeps in that, that I tend to live my life in the middle of. But, but as, I, as I think about that a little bit more, that blockage leads to another blockage. And that blockage is an attitude of shame. Because as I think about loving the unlovable, I realize that I can be pretty arrogant. I remember all the terrible and hurtful things that I've done to people. I remember the friends that I've stabbed in the back, the significant others that I've cheated on when I was younger, the pain and humiliation and hurt that I just spewed at my parents. that I hated. The people whose names I constantly dragged through the mud. And before I know it, I, I end up feeling exactly like this woman before Jesus, like just completely and totally wrapped up and covered up with humiliation and shame and guilt and disgrace. And maybe this is just a therapy session for the next couple of seconds, minutes, whatever it is. But, like, I constantly struggle with being good enough. Like, good enough to be a pastor? Are you kidding? Good enough to be a husband to an incredible wife? Good enough to be a dad? Good enough to stand up here on a Sunday and talk to you about loving people when I suck at it? The reality is I am a filthy, broken, naked sinner who does not in any shape, form, or fashion deserve this unconditional, limitless, unrestricted, never stopping, never giving up, unbreakable, always and forever love. Exactly like this woman. And I think there's some of you in here that feel the same way. But take a look at this story again with me. Jesus places his finger on the chin of this woman and he lifts her eyes to meet his, oozing with compassion and a never stopping, never giving up, always and forever love. He looks at her and he says, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Like the woman, on a regular basis, Jesus lifts my chin up and looks me in the eye and says, I don't condemn you. Go and live a different life because of it. Then in the midst of my sin and my brokenness and my filth and my shame and my guilt and my grossness, he chooses to love me. 
that he sits there and he takes my disgrace and he covers it with his grace. The most incredible thing about him loving the unlovable is that Jesus loves like he had never been hurt before. Like everything that that has been done, everything that will be done, everything that I have chosen to do, everything that I will choose to do has completely and totally been wiped away by the power of the cross. Everything. Man, and so there's this part of me that wants to live the same way and to love the same way. But I think we can. Because we have no idea what it is that Jesus wrote in the dirt or the dust. None. Because if, if you think about it, when you wipe something away in dust and in dirt, there's absolutely no way to figure out what was there. Unlike a paper trail or a digital trail today, the only person that can hold on to it is the person that wrote it. And so up front here, we've got some sand. And in just a little bit, the band is, is going to sing a song over us about how it is that God truly loves us. And so this is what we want you to do. During that time, as you feel led, we want you to come forward. And we want you to get to the sand. And whatever that blockage is, whatever that thing is that keeps you from having an open heart under an open heaven, we want you to do some open heart surgery this morning and remove it. Take that thing. Maybe it's, maybe it's a name of a person that has hurt you beyond anything else that anybody could ever imagine. Maybe it's something that you've done. Because that's the beauty of loving the unlovable is that not only are we called to love the unlovable other people, we're also called to love the unlovable self. And so whatever it is that you've got in your head, the blockage that's in your heart that you can't get past, come up here and ride it in the dirt. But then before you walk away, wipe it away. There's no way that anyone after you will ever know what that thing was that you wrote. It's been wiped away completely and totally. By the power of the cross. So in order for us to have an open heart under an open heaven, we must love the unlovable. That includes other people, and that includes ourselves. And so look, here's the other thing too, is that like we know that some of that stuff may be really heavy. As much as we want to wipe it away in our hearts the same time that we wipe it away in the sand, we know that that's easier said than done. But one of the things that we do around here is we've got a group of people that we call our Next Steps team. And they're going to be up here in just a minute as the band begins to play as well. And as you write that thing down and as you wipe it away, if you need a little extra elbow grease to wipe that thing away in your heart, there's people up here that are ready to pray for you and help you do that. Because again, Heaven is wide open to us. We have learned that week after week. The issue is that we continue to posture and position ourselves in ways that block that blessing. And so today, for us to have an open heart like Jesus, a wide open heart under a wide open heaven, we must love the unlovable. Those people that you've got in your mind, and yourself. Let me pray for that moment. 
God, we thank you so much for loving the unlovable. That includes us. Heavenly Father, right now I ask for strength for every single person in this room. I know that there's not a single person in this room that doesn't have a little bit of blockage at least. And so God, I pray for strength. I pray for courage. That in just a few seconds, they would respond to your call to have an open heart. Help us to love like you love every single day. Help us to come up here every morning, every minute of every day, and to write that thing in the sand and wipe it away just as you did on the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for doing that. It's in your name that I pray.